Good morning everyone. Today as part of our tangible series I'm going to spend about 20 minutes looking at the parable of the sheep and the goats or the sheep and the kids as I think it should be renamed uh, which Alan kindly read out to us. Hopefully on the way in you've got a handout with the passage on it and talk outline and Bible references in case you wanted to check them later. A lot of Jesus' parables have one central point or moral that gets rammed home with memorable imagery and strong rhetoric. The parable we're looking at today is an excellent example of that. Um, however, there is some disagreement about what the central point is. My aim today is to try to explain why I think uh, the central point is that Jesus wants us to be mature, to show practical and tangible care for others primarily motivated by love for him and love for them. The ESV, which I'm using throughout this talk unless otherwise noted, usually translates each Greek word to one English word. This makes it easier uh, to see where there are patterns. As we can see, the treatment of the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick and imprisoned is explicitly discussed four times. There are also two implicit uh, mentions. We will now look at the treatment itself. One thing that I noticed about the treatment um, in the first column is that even when we can't immediately address all of someone's needs, for example, when they are sick or in prison, we can still care for them by visiting. As Matt said in the first talk in this series, that we can't do everything shouldn't stop us from doing what we can. Another important thing to note is that everyone experiences at least some of these things during their life. This isn't them and us. We shouldn't look down on anyone who is currently less fortunate than we are. There are lots of motivations to care for people, but I'll focus on the five that we find in this parable. The first motivation is love for Jesus. We believe God has experienced what it's like to be human when he became a baby to a working class family and spent 33 years getting his hands dirty caring for countless people before being brutally crucified. However, now that Jesus has been resurrected, he is intimately bound to humanity. So much so that he experiences all our joys and suffering. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. The closest thing that I can think of is empathy. When we have empathy, we mentally put ourselves in someone else's shoes. I think that Jesus did this while he was on earth, but now he really is in our shoes, being spiritually inside us. And this is not the only um, time that this idea comes up. Mark 9 is another example of this, where Jesus says, Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me and the Father. So one of the ways we can love Jesus is by loving everyone who he is so intimately connected to. Indeed, John tells us we cannot love God unless we love others. The second motivation in this parable is Jesus' example of love and empathy for others. While it's not explicitly stated here, I think one of the implications of the first motivation is that we should try to imitate Jesus' connectedness, to try to develop our own empathy and love towards the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick and imprisoned. And of course, it is explicitly stated in many other passages throughout the Bible. For example, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, i.e. imitating Jesus, even if the person you are caring for is hostile. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons or imitators 
of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, while he blesses them. If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the non-Jews do the same. Be perfect in loving those who hate you, as your heavenly Father is perfect in loving those who hate him. The third motivation is the desire to be mature. Unfortunately, most translations obscure this point, but I was intrigued to discover that in the ancient Greek texts, of around the same age as the New Testament, there are a hundred occurrences of the words airy phos and airy phon, which are Greek words, and well, my attempt at pronouncing them anyway, and that most Greek dictionaries translate the words as young goats or kids. Translating it as kids is further supported by the only other place in the Bible where Eriphos is used. And this is in the parable of the prodigal son. The older brother complains to the father that he never got given a young goat or kid, as the King James Version translates it, to celebrate with. I even found a conservative commentary that acknowledged that the goats, or airy fon, or kids, are on the left. They suggest the diminutive or small version is here used for the goats to convey an impression of their worthlessness. I think this is very bizarre reasoning, as any good shepherd would know that despite the kids' immaturity, they are actually precious investments. So it seems to me Jesus is deliberately contrasting mature sheep with immature baby goats or kids. Or to put it another way, mature people care for others. Immature people don't. Hopefully it's a given that everyone should desire to be mature. The fourth motivation is the inheritance in Jesus' kingdom. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and the righteous will go into eternal life. I plan to look at eternal life in detail in my next talk, so I'll focus on the inheritance aspect here. Inheritance is a strong theme throughout the Bible, but uh, Colossians 3 is a convenient example as it combines the motivations of inheritance with the motivations of love for Jesus, which we've already looked at. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically, as something done for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. Interestingly, there's also a link between inheritance and maturity. As Paul points out in Galatians, kids don't inherit until they mature or come of age. He writes, So long as an heir is a child, he in no respect differs from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But God sent his son so that we might receive recognition as sons, which I think should be translated, come of age. Therefore, you are no longer like a slave or a child, but a son, and if a son, then an heir, also through God's own act. The fifth motivation is the warning of punishment. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment. I'll be unpacking these verses in my next talk especially how I think this actually relates to the kid's immaturity, which needs divine correction. But for now, I think we should heed his warning that there are painful consequences to our selfishness. So to summarise the motivations for practically caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick and imprisoned, we want to be motivated, motivated by one, love for Jesus, Two, the example of Jesus' love and empathy for others, the 
3. The desire to be mature. 4. The inheritance of Jesus' kingdom. And 5. The warning of punishment. But with our modern society with welfare and professional medical systems, initially it might be hard to think of ways to actually apply this. Most of us don't see starving, naked, sick people on a daily basis. I thought about some application points, though. At the very least, I think when God does place people in our path, we need to be careful not to ignore them, not to turn away like the priest did in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Sometimes caring will be physically or emotionally messy. It'll make us unclean, if you like. But we need to try to overcome our fear of getting our hands dirty. Likewise, caring for people takes time. And this is a, an application I can really, um, uh, yeah, it really applies to me at the moment. Um, and uh, we live in a culture that bombards us with things to do, be it sport or hobbies, watching the latest TV show or movie, browsing Facebook or YouTube, or playing a computer game, or Minecraft or Candy Crush. There are countless, countless ways that we can spend our time. There can also be pressure to do extra hours for an employer at the office or with professional development or with answering emails from home. While all of these things may be good in and in, in of, them, of themselves, if we don't do them in moderation, if we don't carefully manage our time, we'll soon end up with no time for other people and certainly no time for caring for other people as we need to. Caring doesn't have to be grand or glamorous either. Simply saying hello to the person next to you on the bus or on the street is welcoming a stranger. Or it could be visiting an elderly person who can't get out much anymore. I think uh, feeding and uh, clothing your children is also a very good application. There are also groups like the Channel Odd Job Team or COT that practically help people with things like gardening or cleaning the house for people who, who no longer can do those things themselves. No expertise or big commitments are required. It's mainly just about turning up and lending a hand. You might not be aware, but there's an organisation called Prison Fellowship Australia who visit people in prison. Some people from here have been involved in the past. And if you're interested, it's very easy to find their website. More broadly, there are countless charities and missionaries who literally do feed and clothe people, which we can either support with our time or our money. Likewise, when it comes to uh, issues and international issues, I think we should be influenced by this parable. I think complex, although they're complex, issues like asylum seekers, both in, in Europe and in Australia, and um, we've seen Ebola in Africa and natural disasters, the, the awful earthquakes that have been happening in Nepal. There are lots of suffering people, and um, when when it comes to caring for others, we we can we can um, we can be involved in, in giving feedback to the government about how foreign aid should be should be spent and where it should be spent. However, when we're doing these things, we need to be careful to remember that we aren't earning our salvation, which is fortunate because no one consistently and perfectly cares. Everyone is a kid some of the time. Anyway, the important thing is that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from ourselves, not from our works. He is God's gift so that no one can boast. When I was preparing this, I was very puzzled that there isn't any explicit mention of faith in this parable, and that everyone is so surprised that their actions relate to Jesus. However, when we look at the broader context of the book of Matthew, we find that there are three parables before this one, and in each of them, there are people who are surprised at Jesus' return. And given the sheep in the parable we're looking at, parallel the faithful slaves and the sensible virgins in those other parables, it's fair to assume the sheep's practical care 
is an outworking of their faith. We should also remember that we aren't doing this alone and that ultimately Jesus will feed the hungry, quench the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, heal the sick and free the imprisoned, both physically and spiritually. As Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This theme appears throughout the book of Revelation, for example in chapter 7. The one, Jesus, seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. For the Lamb, Jesus, who is at the centre of the throne, will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of living waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I'll finish up with two Bible verses or passages that I th think nicely sum up what this parable is primarily about. God said, isn't the fast or religious practice that I choose to break the chains of wickedness, to set the oppressed free, and to untie and tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? And just in case you're tempted to limit this to your own flesh and blood, I'll finish with one of my favourite Bible verses, which may well have been inspired by the parable we looked at today. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Which I'd suggest is, it is imitating exactly what God does. Anyway, I hope you have found this parable motivating. If you have any questions or objections, feel free to talk to me afterwards or send me an email or message me on Facebook. Thank you.